this morning before we begin. And next Sunday morning is the hanging of the greens. And thank you, thank you to everybody who came and polished brass and cleaned up yesterday. Beautiful. Thank you. Cleaned up. Yeah. Cleaned up. What else? Yes. Uh, we just should always announce coffee hour. Coffee hour after church. Coffee hour, yes. Um, does anybody know anything about the cake rolls in the fridge? Nope. Yeah. Was that the family that made the, no, did the... Maybe. Yeah, I know about that. I just wanted to make okay. I didn't want to use something that wasn't... Really? Nope. Don't know about that. Other announcements. I'll do one logistic one before we begin today, because when we get going, our call to worship today is actually the song we would do during the service. But they put it as the call to worship today, so there's no song during the service. Does that make sense? Okay. Say that again. And also pay attention to the readings and things that are up here because the numbers for the, for the hymns and the numbers for the readings in your bulletin are not correct this morning. Just a glitch on saving paste and cut and paste and, you know, how that goes, okay? Good. Other announcements? not, let us begin our service of worship and gratitude today. <laughs> oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us join together today in our responsive call to worship, which is Psalm number 132. And the refrain is, let us go to God's dwelling place. Remember in David's favor all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Let us go to God's dwelling place. We heard of it in Epiphel. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place for his worship at his footstool. Rise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place. You and the ark of your might, let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your faithful shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my decrees, and I shall teach them, their sons also forevermore shall sit on your throne. Let us go to God's dwelling place. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will reside, for I have desired it. 
I will abundantly bless its provisions. I will satisfy its poor with bread. Its priests I will clothe with salvation. Its faithful will shout for joy. There I will cause a horn to sprout up for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. His enemies I will clothe with disgrace, but on him his crown will gleam. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we come not only to your dwelling place, but we pray that all of the earth become your dwelling place, where there is bread for the poor, where our crowns will gleam. Let us listen today intently to the words of Scripture, to the wisdom of the ages, to that which you would will for us and for our heirs forever and ever. Amen. Let us join together now in that prayer that Jesus taught those that he called brother and sister and friend by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is number 26 in our New Century Hymnals. Number 26. And I need a hymnal. join together in our prayer of confession this morning. Eternal monarch, you who rule over all of us with justice and care, your people confess that we do not submit ourselves to your rule, 
In response to the words, we beseech you, O God, please say the following, that we do not always participate in your reign of equity and integrity, that we have not allowed the example you set forth. Instead, we often place our trust in leaders who let us down and in our own flawed leadership of others. We beseech you, O God, lead us, Christ our Sovereign, and set us on the path to righteousness, rule in all that we do. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we who are dependent upon our divine ruler have Christ's example ever before us to give us guidance and hope. So take heart that you are forgiven and may return to that example once again being at peace with our God, let us share a sign of God's peace with one another. There. We all feel better now. I think so. I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Our first reading this morning is from the second book, Second Samuel, in chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. Let's be attentive to the word of our still speaking God in our reading. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the Lord God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made me with an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and all my desire? But the godless are like the thorns that are thrown away, 
for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. We ask God to bless our understanding this reading from Scripture. And, yeah, we, we don't have it because we didn't do the psalm this morning. So, I will do the epistle reading. Our epistle reading this morning is from the book of Revelation, beginning in chapter 1 with verse 4. Again, let us be attentive to the word of our still-speaking God. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Again, we ask God to bless our understanding this reading from Scripture. Forget how this goes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's terrible. Okay, there it goes. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel according to John, beginning in chapter 18 with verse 33. If those who are able would please rise for the reading of the gospel and all others, please rise in spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. And Jesus said, do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. And Jesus answered, 
you say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Our hymn is 596, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. Seated. <clears throat> do, to do, 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 to do. So, anything, anybody? I got nothing. <laughs> no, really, anything? Strike anybody? Anything like you went what? Or hmm? <laughs> no? Really? One who rules over people justly. Look at this. Some nice things in there, huh? I love that. And then, of course, there's the Revelation story. You know, you want to make your head hurt, go read Revelation. Try and make sense out of it. Apocalyptic language, you know. So we go from sacrificial language to apocalyptic language to mystic language to poetic language today. We go all over. And we have this wonderful song that we started off with that talks about, um, you know, this, this constancy, right? This covenant. And then we shift focus a little bit, but we still get what? This message of constancy, right? And faithfulness and covenant. And we hear the story of Revelation, which is like, mm, okay. And then we get this story in the gospel that basically says, look at dude, you didn't get it. If, if I was the king of the Jews, they'd be here bashing the doors down. They wouldn't let you get me, but guess what? That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to call you guys out and tell the truth. I'm here to be the one that pokes you in the eye, you know? Is that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to be the ones that poke people in the eye? Sometimes, some ways. Is it really poking someone in the eye when you tell them the truth? <clears throat> or is it calling them out? And when do we call them out? 
We had this trial this week that kind of divided the country in two equal parts. It was a little weird. If you weren't of a legal, you know, had legal training or, or some legal mind, you might have come to one decision. And if you were purely doing it on a motion, you'd come to another decision. And then there could be, you know, a third way through it. Um, we're not on camera, okay? So just a show of hands, how many people think there should have been some kind of responsibility that had to be taken on the young man's part? Something had to be done, right? And how many think, no, he was all, he was all good. Okay. So the issue became this thing of what is correct under the law and what is correct under how we feel and how we think society should act. It's exactly the same thing Jesus was fighting. The law says one thing, and I think that in this case, although it might not have been prosecuted perfectly, I think the jurors really did what they had to do because of what the law said. And they were bound them to the law to determine what happened. I think they read the instructions very carefully and followed them to the letter. And it was a very tough decision for them. But we all know that something's very wrong with a young man taking a gun, going to another town, taking it upon himself to be the sheriff, you know, going to ride in a white horse. There's multiple things wrong there. It's not just the act of the young man, but what made him feel that he had an obligation or a right, and I think he probably felt he had an obligation, to rise up and go out against something. What fires us up and makes us rise out and rise up against anything? What is it that does it? We often say it's righteous indignation, don't we? I am righteously indignant. Sounds good that way instead of saying I'm pissed off. Right? <laughs> so the real question is, you know, what makes us PO? And it's usually either something about money, right? Somebody took something from us we didn't think that they deserved. Or it's about a relationship, which gets people really wound up. And they get emotional and we have, you know, murders based on that. That, that passion thing, that, that crime of passion. Or we feel oppressed. Right? And we rise up out of <clears throat> oppression of some kind. So what made this young man rise up the way he did? I think he had passion, didn't he? We, whether, we, whether we like it or not, whether we think it was proper or not, is not the question. It was, was there passion there? And there, was, there had to be passion there to take the steps that he took you know, I mean, he, he prepared himself. He girded himself for a type of battle. There had to be some passion there. There had to be some indignation there. Whether it was righteous or not, I have no clue. I don't think so. But there had to be indignation. He was upset over a group of people that he perceived as being from out of town, taking over the area he lived in to protest something he probably didn't believe in. And then, what's the next one? Did he feel oppressed? I think he did. I think for some reason he felt like an oppressed white man. I think he hadn't worked through the issues of being intimidated somehow. We got another tiny glimpse into that part of this in the trial in Georgia this week where the attorney said, I don't want any more black pastors coming into the courtroom and intimidating the jurors. And there was only one black juror. What? So exactly who were these pastors intimidating? And how were they intimidating the jury? Was it because they were black? Think about that. Did the very color of their skin act as the intimidating factor to this lawyer, something they could not change any more than someone can change their eye color or change that they are born differently or that they are differently able. All these things we protect in society because you cannot change them. 
those are the things we protect the most, you cannot change your blackness or your whiteness or whatever color you are. Not only that, but this attorney actually doubled down on it and said that there was a rabid crowd of them outside like a modern lynch mob outside the courthouse when they gathered for a prayer meeting. Can you imagine that? What is it in society that has thrown us off balance to think that the color of someone's skin is intimidating and that the non-color of your skin makes you feel intimidated and that you feel oppressed by a group of people simply trying to do their best to be co-equal and you feel like you have to rise up and take arms in their struggle against you. What lessons do we learn from what we heard today in light of what we have lived just this week? What is it that we are called to do? Are we called to be as close as we can be like Jesus to sit there in the face of this governor, Pilate, who calls him out and he says very calmly, you say I'm the king. If I were a king, my people would rise up against you and I wouldn't be here. I came, I was born to simply tell the truth. I was born to tell the truth. So what's that mean for us? We hear through these lessons today as the theology develops that, of course, in the oldest story, Israel is set aside by God. It is the place where God will reside. It is the dwelling place of the Lord. And they are convinced of it. They are convinced that they are righteous because God has smiled upon them and they're going to do everything they can to get their nation, which is still a nation state. But the theology has changed, right? It's not just simply ordained by God that this will be the place. This was their belief, that they were protected by their God in this dwelling place, no matter what they did. The theology starts to morph a bit when we hear about the sacrifices. And we hear about all of us being born into the priesthood, which makes us a little confused because we go, eh. but if we think about it, that high end of society was the priesthood, the royal priesthood. They had control over everything. They oppressed the population. So the psalmist talks about the desire to be born into that priesthood, that all of us may be at that level. Not white, not black, not Jew, not Greek. Not poor, not rich, not Gentile. All of us born into that priesthood. What's changed? There's been advances, obviously. We no longer live in that stratified society, but we live in a stratified society. We still have people who yearn every day simply for the chance to earn equal to another doing their labor who strive to be treated as an equal simply because their gender, their sex, the color of their skin, their degree of education, where they were born, what their name might be, you name it. We still have the struggle ongoing. Nothing changes. The human condition is the human condition. What changes is our ability to find ways to make it more and more just over time. We have found in Christianity a way for us to call out society in peaceful ways, in nonviolent ways, in ways that can adjust leaders' thinking. We do it in this method of calling them out, pointing out the injustices, but more than pointing out the injustices, also laying paths towards that equality, 
towards that kingdom on earth, towards that day when there will be no more hunger or weeping. We know, we know there is enough. What we do in calling out those who would not distribute that enough in the places that it needs to be distributed is simply to point back to this human condition. That we are all, all of us as children of God, no matter what race, no matter what creed, we are all children of the Creator. We are all humans. We are all born in the same way. We all die in the same way. There is no one, there is no one who does not belong equally in this family of God, in this family of what we call Christianity, in this family of faith and hope in a better world. There is no one who does not deserve, no matter what, simply by their being, they deserve to be clothed and fed and sheltered and cared for in their illnesses and cared for in their old age. It is simply the greater family. Not our nuclear family, not even our extended family. It is the family of God. It is the family of the whole human race. And whatever I do or you do that either helps or hinders that is what really matters. When we step back and take a look at it that way, then climate change issues, then race issues, all of those issues fade. They start to fade when we look from that God's eye view earth out in space as Don Eaton speaks about. We need to think, each and every one of us, what it is that has caused us to become a divided nation. And we need to work with every ounce of fiber and being that we have to begin the healing process that will close that wound so that we can begin to make the great progress that this nation was founded on and continues to make. Despite all of its failings, despite all of its flaws, there has never been a place where equality was so exalted, not always perfectly, but so exalted as where we live. We need to continue and improve to be a more shining beacon, a brighter city on the a place where there is no hunger, where there is no homelessness to the best of our ability to cure those things. We need to continue to reach out to all of those in the family of God. Amen. Are there joys and concerns to share today? I'm going to share one. My mom's 103 today. And uh, doing well. And we're going to have uh, cake and stuff a little bit later today. And um, so, yeah, pretty cool. You know, pretty cool. Other joys and concerns? Uh, the elementary kids are finally beginning to get vaccinated. That is huge. I'm getting my booster after church. I'm getting my booster in like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. You did? Okay, good. I've had, I've had several people who had the Moderna booster and said, ooh, I got laid right out after. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Well, I do too. I have the Moderna. No problem. Yeah, see? It's all over the place. It's interesting. I did have a friend die of COVID this morning at 7 o'clock, by the way. Um, so I would ask her for uh, prayers for the family of Paul Cardinal, um, one of the oldest uh, funeral directors in the state of Vermont, from Pruno Poli and Barry, a great man. I was up and visited him yesterday. Uh, last week I visited him and then, then I visited him yesterday, um, but he did not make his struggle with COVID uh, this morning at 7 o'clock. So our prayers for, for that family, for Paul, an extended family. Have you been vaccinated? He had not only been vaccinated, but he had his booster. And he had COVID, and they gave him the monoclonal antibodies, and he did well, and then he relapsed, and there was just no, nothing they could do. That's Yeah, yeah, that's three COVID deaths this week that I've dealt with. So, other joys and concerns. If 
not, must be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious Creator God, we thank you for bringing us together on this late fall day. We thank you for the bright sunshine and the cold mornings. We thank you for the warmth of family and hearth. We thank you for the shared hearts in this space. But most of all, we thank you for calling us to be members of the family of God. Amen. continue our service with a gathering of our tithes and offerings. This is a song that Tom likes. Hearth and fire the hours tonight and all the dark outside Fair the night and kind on you wherever sun upon your head, the wind about your face. My love upon the path you tread, and upon your wanderings peace. Wine and song be ours tonight, and all the cold outside. And warmth be yours tonight, wherever you may buy. And I'd be the sun upon your head, the wind about your face. My love upon the path you tread, and upon your wanderings peace. Hearth and fire be ours tonight and the wind in the birch is bare oh that the wind we hear tonight would find you well and fair and i'd be the sun upon your head the wind about your face my love upon the path you tread and upon your wanderings peace my love upon the path you tread and upon your wanderings peace thank you Larry <laughs> Merciful and gracious creator, we thank you for these gifts, these tokens of our lives, and we ask that you bless them and make them worthy for the use of your church. Amen. And our hymn is number 423 in our New Century Hymnals, number 423. Great is your faithfulness.
peace of God which passes all understanding descend upon each and every one of you, remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.